Here we are once again at the lovely corner of Glenwood and Lunt. We're in the heart of Rogers Park. We're up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe. You're listening to another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. I'm Michael James. I'm here with... Me. Katie Hogan. That's right. And we're going to have... And uh, it's uh, Thanksgiving weekend. It is Thanksgiving weekend. Everybody's a little thudded out from the trip to fan. Actually, I wasn't feeling so hot for the last few days, so I haven't eaten at all. I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving, maybe today or tomorrow. And... Um, the other thing is, the rest of the world is uh, really going to, you know, wearing a handbasket right now between Syria and uh, Middle East. Some really terrible things going on out there in the Congo, et cetera. And here, you know, I just can't help but I watch the news and I walk out on the street and everybody parks where they're supposed to and moves their car when they're not supposed to, not supposed to be there. And uh, how do we get off so easy? You know. In the whole scheme of things. Anyway, that was my, uh, you know, larger-than-life metaphysical questioning today. Um, and we have a good show. We have a couple guests, a uh, couple familiar guests. One is Terry Abramson. Yeah, and he's going to come up a little bit later. He's going to talk about his new book, In the Belly of the Beast, Chicago to Boston to L.A., 1969 to 1983, a memoir. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to start off today with our pal David Orr. He is the Cook County Clerk, he is the former alderman of the 49th Ward, and he was, what number was that, Mayor? I really don't know. Okay, well I had it, I had it on a Google yesterday. He was a mayor of Chicago for a couple of days, and in many ways we wish he had been the mayor for a lot longer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the one, the reason we called on our friend and neighbor and longtime uh, mentor ally and mentor, all these things, and cohort and colleague and etc. Um, teacher. Teacher, that's right. <laughs> David was my teacher. Let it all be known that he was my history prof a long time ago. And, and uh, anyway, uh, together we uh, worked to elect David Orr to this office here in the 49th Ward in 1979. It was a great moment for an independent political organization just starting out, which David built into something that remains today, uh, the independent Democrats of the 49th Ward. But there was also then that moment uh, after you had been re-elected alderman in 1983, the same time that Harold Washington was elected mayor for the first time in one heck of a race uh, and that we all celebrated right here in this room, I think. Um, there was a period of time there where you were in the council, the mayor was elected, and we had what has suddenly come back to us all in these last couple of years something that uh, the Congress looks like these days. Uh, not, didn't matter what was said, what was offered by the mayor's office, that council, as long as it was 29 versus 21, was that it? Right. Uh, they weren't going to do anything for Mayor Daley. And you were... Uh, mayor, mayor Washington. Mayor Washington, sorry. Uh, would that the other were the case. But anyway, you were named vice mayor. Uh, how soon after he was elected? Or was it after he was re-elected? Uh, that, that was 1987. Yeah. Because remember, um, there had never been a vice mayor before. But after Daley Sr. died, and there was chaos picking who would take over. At the time, people thought Wilson Frost... Uh, should be the new mayor, but he was black, and so they put in someone from the 11th Ward. But the compromise, they went to Springfield and created the post of vice mayor. Mm -hmm. And so that really didn't start until after Jane Byrne was elected. Okay. Uh, and the vice, so the... Um, so, um, you, were, you were there. Did you... I mean, do you remember how it felt here in Chicago between 83 and 87? Well, there's so many great lessons if, when looking back at that time. And, and history hasn't been too kind, and we can talk about it if we get a chance, because uh, remember, those who control the present control the past. And so uh, since the machine pretty much controlled things after Harold's death, uh, their history, I think, is distorted. But if you go back and look at the time, what's so relevant for us today is one of the most critical things that Her uh, Harold did during that 83 to 87 is he got people involved, engaged citizens. We've never seen anything like that before. And if we look at what's going on in the country and we see how the right wing got engaged and pushed our entire agenda to the right, uh, intimidated the Democrats and the president, 
Uh, and so that similar thing is happening, and so we, need, we can learn a lesson from this, that you can't have progressive politics unless you have an engaged in citizenry, and that's what Harold did. Every night, all of a sudden, tens of thousands of people that never watched the news were watching the news. Mm -hmm. Tens of thousands of people never got active were active. And so, particularly in the African American community, the progressive community, it was off the charts. People got involved, and that helped him to win this battle. So, see, it's one thing to win in 83. When the arrogance of the machine, two white powerful candidates, Jane Byrne, Rich Daly, went against each other with the assumption it's one of them because obviously no African American could win. Um, but to be reelected in 87 as a black man in a place like Chicago, uh, that shows a lot in the same way that Obama was able to. So a big part of this whole thing is race. Yeah. Race was critical then, critical now. It yeah. shaped everything. And it wasn't simply the machine folks were racist or their backers were. Many of them were um, upset, like people today. They just they couldn't understand how a black person could be in charge. But Rove the was like the uh, Rove on election night here last couple weeks That's ago. Right. Was very much like uh, the uh, Chicago commentators on the election night in 1983. They were almost doing... <laughs> I mean, really, they were so... Clueless, <laughs> and m a lot of us who supported him knew he was going to win because they had split the vote, for one. But also because that engagement that you talked about started even before he was elected exactly. by virtue of making us all deputy registrars. That was a great movement. Uh, for those again, or uh, a lot of your listeners know this, but um, there was a tremendous engagement prior to Harold's election. When again the machine was fighting each other, and there's a bloodbath in the 11th Ward and others, where uh, you know the white supporting Daly hated the white supporting Byrne. It was really ugly. But in the meantime, for the rest of the um, city, they were looking at alternatives, and uh, the uh, you know, black leaders at the time, uh, many of whom you know and have talked about over the years, did a great job of building a movement um, and we that movement led to incredible three that's right incredible yeah. registration off yeah. the charts which led to this great victory yeah well one of the things I like to uh, uh, say is that uh, it was the old rainbow coalition and a lot of other activists that uh, laid the groundwork for Harold Washington Harold Washington laid the groundwork for Obama and here we are what's your take on the legacy of Harold Washington well, I think when people uh, look carefully, and like I said earlier, that um, partly because of Daly coming in 1979, uh, there was a movement <coughs> among, let's say, more moderate machine folks to paint that period as a reporter called it, the Bay Row and the Lake. And basically, it was a terrible time. Uh, no one could get anything done. Um, and people fought each other racially, and thank God we moved beyond that period. And that is a gigantic myth and a disservice to history, because if you start looking at what happened in those five and a half years, yes. it was incredible. Um, the engagement is, is clearly important, I mentioned. The notion of fairness. We haven't had that kind of fairness since Harold died. And fairness just didn't mean he said, listen, when I do this capital development, all these great projects that I'm going to do in this city that the machine tried to block, he said it's going to be fair. The northwest side is going to get just as much as the south side. Some of his people didn't like that, but the fact is that what he did. So it wasn't just saying that we're going to have fairness and resources. It was a principle that we've not seen since in which the average guy was being represented by the government. Or the little guy, if you want to call it like that. And the problem, unfortunately, with the Democrats, even today and then, is to a great extent, and particularly under Daley, the little guy wasn't represented. And if you look at the issues that were discussed at that time, housing, transportation, public schools. All the urban all issues. All the things that affect average people. Right. Okay, it's not just building Millennium Park or making downtown so beautiful that people will move down there. It was doing things that affected the lives of its three million citizens. And that is too often forgotten. And it did so many good things on the housing front. He was the guy that started school reform. He was the guy that actually uh, had honest budgets for the first time. Uh, so there, there was a great history there that people, I think, are missing. Well, and one of the things that you just said, um, it, yeah, it hasn't been as fair since. Um, one of the things that your engagement uh, piece about Harold, ha that has not stopped, in addition to the school reform beginnings, and he, he developed the notion of local Tom. school reform, um, of local school councils. He set that up. And uh, 
He also set up that there would be advisory councils in every park district, many of which still still exist. And um, Michael is trying to tell Tom to turn on the PA. Um, and uh, sorry. Uh, and I, I think that 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 did in fact last for a lot of people the expectation of fairness the expectation that they have a voice in these institutions that are ours whether it's the schools or the parks um, and yeah it, it big time backsliding in terms of letting letting go of local school councils letting go of supporting the other advisory councils um, and it's up to the individual schools and advisory councils to continue to build strength and which is hard against no support but, but it proves something that is so critical today people don't believe that government will pay attention to them yeah. and the right wing has made government the enemy and what it proved at the time before Harold the old machine had all these uh, advisory councils just like everybody else something called the CDBG right. community development block grant and there was all these people some of them important put on these committees the committees would come in and vote for something and the mayors whether it's Belandica they totally ignore it whatever they said they ignored it <laughs> Under Harold, they became lively engagement things where they were listened to. And so for a time there, and you know, the voters aren't dumb. When voters realize the government is paying attention to them, they participate more. When mm -hmm. they realize they're not, uh, they don't as much. And so that's such an important lesson that when, okay, the leadership is actually listening to the public, you can do things. And that's what we're all hoping, frankly, is a relevance now. Right. Is it, is it uh, people did reelect President Obama. Um, and if they, now I think all the activists realize that the only way to move this country forward is to stay Activated. active, which they didn't before, and push that agenda, because otherwise the money, the lobbyists, the, all those who want to help, only that small group of people will, will continue to control the agenda. You know, we were, we were lucky, David, you and I, we had a lot of good times with Mayor Washington, and... Uh, and we, and we had him up here in our neck of the woods a few times walking around. There's a great picture that you and I have of him waving at people standing up on the Morris Station platform. He was a great guy to, to have as a candidate because he actually really cared about Chicago. And maybe you have uh, a vignette or, or a story. I know I have a couple, but... Uh, you're the guest, so I'm, I'm not going to do all the talking. Well, I have a, I, I have one that's kind of fun and one that's uh, more serious. Uh, the fun one is, uh, you know, I used to teach history, as, as you mentioned before, and uh, one of my, I always said my favorite mayor was a guy named Hazen Pingree, who <laughs> no one's ever heard of, right. but he was this incredibly uh, progressive mayor of Detroit way back in the 1880s and 90s. I remember you telling me that in school, He's David. A, uh, he was a great, great mayor. But Harold Washington was a very bright guy, and he, he, he read everything. So, I don't know, we were talking about that one day, and I made the mistake of saying he was my favorite mayor. Of course, he gave me a hard time on that. And then I gave him this book called Reform in Detroit. And literally, I think a week later, you know, when we were talking, he starts asking me all these detailed questions about Pingree in the book. Yeah. That was the kind of guy he was. And I yeah. said, well, he's no longer my favorite mayor. He's my <laughs> second favorite mayor. <laughs> the, uh, the, the second and more important story is that I spent the longest time um, with Harold Washington the day before he died. You know, a lot of the other times were, you know, fairly short, maybe meetings, of, but just the two of us. And it's so relevant for what we're talking about in today because this was obviously November. Uh, the day before he died, and, and uh, right before Thanksgiving, and he was showing his frustration, and his frustration was, you activists, okay, you want everything to be perfect, but you're not out there enough. You're not pushing the agenda. I, meaning here in Washington, I can't do all this stuff myself. Hmm. I gotta, you know, I gotta keep all these people happy, and I, you know, right. I got all this assault from the media. I need the progressives to get out there and, and form a wing and move more than they are. Right. He, uh, and uh, it was so perfectly relevant. And we did the same thing with Obama. We kind of sat back, and we, we had this naive notion sometimes that if, if we elect the right people, they can do whatever we want. Well, we have to remember the system is still stacked against regular people. We know it. It's even much worse today than it was then. I'll and say. so, again, um, that's what he was saying. Unfortunately, it was the day before he died, saying, get out there, lead the charge. And unfortunately, because of his death, uh, that charge failed, and the coalition was dramatically weakened, and... Uh, People and didn't we lost stick the together. Yes, right. Yeah. Well, one story I have about dragging him around town uh, in the re-election campaign in '87, uh, I I got 
all the requests I put in for time with Harold, and because we would just bring them to where people. Harold were. liked you a lot, Katie. He did well. I, <laughs> you know, I won three out of six awards for him. <laughs> that that hadn't happened four years prior, but. Um, we're in the 43rd Ward, and they're doing their wine and cheese kind of Democratic Party endorsement session. He was kind of ticked off at having to show up, and however, they treated him inside. Anyway, after that, we're walking him down Clark Street. There's a lady in a trench coat coming at us. I'm walking f some 10 or 15 feet in front of the mayor, passing out flyers saying, Here, meet the mayor. He's in your neighborhood today to meet you. And this lady, um, as I reached out with a flyer, sort of whipped away and <laughs> said, no, I'm not taking that. And then I thought, well, I'm going to see what happens when she crosses paths with Hazana. <laughs> and I turned around, and he had caught that entire little uh, back and forth and uh, kept his eye on her as he was greeting other people. And as he, she got closer and she's going on the s s uh, grass to not bump into him, he extends his hand to her, looks her in the eye, and said, I knew you'd show up. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was completely, she had to laugh, she had to <laughs> shake his hand, and that was it, you know. And, uh, you know, coming where I came from on the southwest side, which you, you know a lot about the city, it was pretty, pretty heavily anti-black where I grew up in Mount Greenwood. And one thing that was true the entire time I was there was no curbs, no gutters, our basements always flooded. Before Harold was reelected, before the reelection campaign came around, he had put curbs and gutters in Mount Greenwood. I know that he he won a few 